techies and geeks around the world unite. It's time again for another episode of the SMC Journal podcast, the show where we talk about software engineering and all kinds of concepts around anything to do with IT. Uh, That's me. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you for joining me. And today's show is something that I should have put out probably over six months ago. And in this show, there are no sponsors. There are no guests. It's me talking to you about a topic that's very important to my heart. It's what is DevPerf Ops. So you may never have even heard of DevPerf Ops unless you are an avid follower of me on LinkedIn or you have heard some of the recent presentations that I've given where I may have mentioned it. I want to tell you a story about how it came about and why it is a real thing, but why it shouldn't be. All right. And I know that's kind of confusing. So give me a chance to just tell you the background of where DevPerf Ops came from. If we go to December of 2023, I was in Orlando at a performance advisory council meeting that featured six to eight people. Every year we get together. It's um, it's an invite only thing where different people present on performance engineering topics. And really it's, it's vendor neutral, uh, vendor agnostic. It's about how do we bring the performance engineering community forward? How do we make contributions to it to make it better for everybody? And I am all into that, and many of you know that. We were talking about that fact of, you know, our community is, seems to be getting smaller. The education around performance seems to be getting less. There's not a whole lot of books. There's not a lot of uh, classes on this. And it seems that performance engineers have had title changes, mainly because why stick with your same title if you can do some of the same task, some other task, and get more money? Why wouldn't you move over to be a, an SDET, a software de- a developer, uh, a development engineer in test? Why wouldn't you be a site reliability engineer in SRE if you can make more money at that and you can learn additional skills? Some people just want to be in the cool kids club. Some people want to just do what Google says is important to do. And I understand that, and that's fine. I personally don't think that's for everybody. I think if you think about the business, it's about whatever works for your business, right? But that's beside the point. When you start hearing about uh, continuous delivery, continuous testing, we think about continuous performance. That's something that is important to me. And when you're operating in a DevOps model, you really need to be continuous. And it's these small incremental changes, it's the shift left of performance and testing that gives you early feedback often and hopefully prevents a lot of problems when you're deploying the software and you don't get caught around, you know, these type of performance issues late in the game. You catch them earlier, it's, you know, it's, it's a fact, it, it's a lot less expensive to fix. So as we look through, uh, we were talking about DevOps and, you know, I'm in this mindset back at this conference about how do I make a contribution to make things better for the, the group as a whole, where is everybody's head at right now? It's, it's in DevOps, it's in continuous delivery. So I got to looking at DevOps and the topic of DevSecOps came up. And of course, I've got a show called The Security Champions, and I've been dealing with the whole DevSecOps, AppSec, security uh, crowd for over a year now. And I noticed a trend here. And I want to bring this up on my screen of just a typical search that you might do. If you go to a search uh, engine and you type in DevSecOps, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see what is DevSecOps, question mark. Uh, these the companies that are producing this content, let's look at the names of them. They're very recognizable. Red Hat, IBM, Amazon, as in Amazon AWS, Cloud, Microsoft, Palo Alto Networks. All of the major uh, observability vendors are also on board with this. You'll find what is DevSecOps on the Dynatrace website, Datadog's website, and others. When somebody puts an article out that says, what is DevSecOps, they're not just explaining it. They want an article out there to be on that search engine so they can get that search engine optimization and be at the top of that engine, which means they really support whatever it is they're talking about. In other words, they are giving their backing and making something credible by explaining it. And then, and most of the times these articles, they're talking about how they have a solution for DevSecOps that will help your organization. 
Now, I have no beef with that, except the fact that if you go back to the original concept of DevOps, there really shouldn't be a DevSecOps, right? Because why does there have to be that sec when security is supposed to be a non-negotiable characteristic of developing and delivering software? A lot of companies, when they implemented Agile, they implemented a form of Agile and maybe Scrum. They didn't necessarily uh, understand Agile and they implemented their version of it, which wasn't really agile. And they tried to implement a piece of agile without the company being truly agile. So the definitions changed. I think the same thing kind of happened with DevOps. There were some early adopters. It seems that security in, in a lot of companies did not become a non-negotiable item. And it began to be overlooked by functionality. And that caused a problem because people were getting hacked. It was like the, the security team and the CISOs woke up one day and said, okay, you know what? We're going to make sure that security now becomes non-negotiable. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our security name and we're going to just shove it right in the middle of DevOps and call it DevSecOps to ensure that you are going to make this a non-negotiable. Should that have ever happened? If DevOps had been implemented the way some of the original books uh, that envisioned what DevOps could be and should be, it, it wouldn't. And I know a lot of you know that that's, that's true. However, DevSecOps is a thing. It is with us, and you cannot unscramble eggs. We have that now. That just kind of ticked me off because you're basically saying that security is special they're more important because if you get hacked, that's more important than you being down. You can't be hacked if the software is down, in my opinion, if it, if it doesn't function. And, and it, I know it gets prioritized. It's got to work first. It's got to be functional. And then it's got to be secure. And then it might need to be fast if you want to gain an advantage. If you are a government agency that has a monopoly on something, maybe performance just kind of sits back there until you feel like making it better. Or, hey, it doesn't really matter to us. It's too expensive to make it performant. But performance has more to do with uh, resiliency and efficiency than just being fast. So we could get into all of that. So I, in, in my opinion, from a performance engineer, performance is just as important as security. So if you start going down this path of, well, DevSecOps gets there, I, I just came to the conclusion that maybe maybe DevPerfOps should be a thing. Maybe companies already have DevOps handled except for performance. Maybe they're doing security right, they're, they do, but they're not doing performance right. Well, DevSecOps would be a subcategory of DevOps. And it basically just says, here's a framework for operating and ensuring that security becomes a non-negotiable. So then I just said, why can't performance be a, a you know, dev perfops be a subcategory uh, of DevOps and ensures that performance becomes a non-negotiable as well. And for some companies, that's more important than others. If you're just announcing birthdays on a website, maybe not so much, but if you're financial uh, and you are uh, something where it's critical that this thing has to be fast, it has to be up, it has to be resilient, has to be efficient. Those are reasons why you might have that kind of subcategory. This is all going on in my head. And so within a couple of hours, I was able to register a domain and put a website out and start what is the Dev Perfops Foundation. And so I want to take you to the post that, that I did on LinkedIn that kind of started it all as I was having this, uh, this idea. This is the post. Dear Performance Community, I proclaim today that Dev Perfops will be and now is, and I am the they, because there's always they say, right? So I am the they that declares that Dev Perfops will be a thing. And of course, right after that, the memes began. Here's one that changed my mind. And here's another one. Dev, Dev Perfops is a real thing. So I kind of made it a little bit humorous, but at that at that point, I was really just frustrated about the whole thing, and I wanted to get some visibility on it. Well, I never really expected that anything would would happen from that, but as I began to talk to other people about that, they thought, you know, there might actually be something to that. So I went out to Chat GPT, or I think it was either Chat GPT or it was Gemini, and I said, "What I want you to do is." Look at DevSecOps as a framework 
Look at all the websites that have defined it and what it is, what it does, the manifesto for it, all of that. And I want you to rewrite it instead of using terms around security, use terms around performance engineering. And I got an output that actually didn't look that bad. And with a little bit of tweaking, uh, we had something. So we started the Dev Perfops Foundation. And so if you go to devperfops.org, you will actually see a definition of Dev Perfops. You will see uh, about all of the, 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 the things that we have defined in it, like what it is, the benefits of it, the practices. And we actually had this reviewed uh, by multiple people who did some additional tweaking around it. And we actually built a Dev Perfops manifesto, which you can uh, go and hear and expound upon and you can see all the details. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, that's really nice. I will send an email out to some people and ask them what they think about it, different companies. And I got a flood of emails back in support of this. And within about a week, as you can see, we have had about 20 companies that actually say, I will endorse this and support this. Now, this includes Catchpoint, Keysight Technologies, Perfana, Request Metrics, uh, QA Consultants, and several other consulting companies. Speed scales, another product. Of course, CMG is a is a conference, and others are coming in. I was surprised at that. So, what initially started as sort of a joke actually became something real. Now, the next step would be to find out like how do we actually turn this into something that is a true foundation, and what can we use as a model? And I got to looking at. The FinOps Foundation, which is at FinOps.org. Let's take a look at that right now. If you go to FinOps.org, you will see the FinOps Foundation, which is uh, kind of like a cousin, maybe a dev perfops, because we both want the same thing. FinOps wants people to stop spending so much money in the cloud and control that cost through efficiencies, which is exactly what performance engineers want for cloud-based systems. I mean, this is really cloud-focused. But it's interesting that this group has this many people, uh, and mainly because there are so many companies that are struggling with their cloud bill because they have done a lot of shifting and lifting, especially during the, the era of 2020 to 2022, uh, where they were taking inefficient software and moving it from on-prem to the cloud. And then the cloud kind of highlights the fact that they're, they're, they're inefficient and the resources are being used, but you're being charged for those and you're being charged a lot more than you thought. So the rise of FinOps was a necessity, I believe. The FinOps Foundation, like several other uh, areas, um, or I should call foundations, is funded by the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is sort of the parent of that. And that's also true for the CNCF as well. So each one of these groups, like the CNCF, they have a conference. There's KubeCon uh, around Kubernetes. FinOps has, has a conference there. And it's, it's considered to be like a nonprofit organization. It's a 501c6. 501c, instead of a 501c3, it's a 501c6, I believe, is, is what the definition of that is. At least that's how the FinOps, or, uh, FinOps Foundation started. You know, how do you put together this nonprofit organization, which doesn't mean there's not money involved. If you look up how much money actually came into the Linux Foundation over the past couple of years annually, it's a lot more than you might suspect. I'll let you do some searching on your own and find that out. But it, it's not just, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or even a few million dollars. It's quite a bit of money. And they fund a lot of these foundations. And so there's conferences around that. There are software and hardware and consulting vendors who participate in these conferences and uh, bring sponsorship funds. There's education and certification around this. And these are all good things to have. And I thought, why can't we do that around performance engineering? So this, although it kind of did start off as more of a cynical-like take on DevSecOps, um, DevProfOps has definitely been defined out there. So let's go back and take a look at the website. So if we look at the manifesto first, just like with the Agile manifesto, it says these are the things that we value and put over other things. Doesn't mean some of those other things aren't important, but these are the things that we consider important. Working software with optimized performance and value 
add documentation. It's not an afterthought to have performance. We want metrics and we want optimization as an ongoing process. Second thing we find is important is that the customer, the end user needs to be thought about when you're thinking about performance. It's not just about the speed of the network, the application, the database. It's about meeting end user expectations and making sure that the end user is ultimately not only just satisfied, but thrilled. We also believe that having a efficient and performant um, application brings you a competitive advantage and not only saves you money, it can make you more money. And it is something where you have to build a culture around it that includes not only performance, but agility and resilience built in as well. Uh, we believe that performance needs to adapt to changing environments. What is was good to test for performance in years past, before Kubernetes, let's say, and after Kubernetes, it, things change. We have to adapt to that. Tools need to adapt to that, and the engineers need to adapt their processes to it. And that's what we should be doing if we're, impl- if we're emphasizing performance as a culture. We also believe in specialization. Now, this, this particular area is a little bit of a controversy because when you start reading books like The Phoenix Project, you read some of Gene Kim's work and some of those uh, the, the early authors of that. Uh, dev DevOps uh, topics. It's the idea is that developers, in a generalist sense, can accomplish a lot of the tasks that we used to use for specialists. Dev Perfops believes that performance is re- it requires specialization because there is so much to performance. I don't personally believe that there are very many developers out there. Possibly a few unicorns do exist. But very few developers know an, as much about performance across the life cycle as a seasoned performance engineer with the same amount of experience, years of experience. Um, that I can't tend to call a person like that a specialist, like a software life cycle engineer with an emphasis around performance. So it's a very narrow focus, performance, not security, not functionality, not anything else. Very small focus, but a very wide scope uh, where you're looking across everything from the time the software's thought about, requirements are created. Yes, I know people do not create requirements. They should be, whether they're user stores or whatever, you need good requirements. The requirements need to be looked at for performance opportunities. And whenever there's a functional user store, a functional requirement, there and there's a question asked about functionality, there should be a question around performance as well and security too but my my focus is performance and it moves into the development phase and it moves into the testing phase the deployment phase the the monitoring phase even after i i want to know how a performance works across all these areas and continue to make them as optimized as i can i believe and many people agree with me that that takes a specialist to do that and when you specialize in something you you can become very excellent at that thing. And you can be faster than a generalist at this. We have this in the medical field. We have general practitioner physicians that you can go to. If you've got a cold, if you've got something going on with you or you break your arm, you go to a doctor for that. But when you need a specialist for heart surgery, brain surgery, some that focuses on a particular area of the body, we have specialists for that. And it works out very well. We also have that in the uh, Military, we have special operations. We have the the Navy SEALs as a special operation with special skill sets to do the things that they do. And I just believe in this case, and I know I'm biased, I believe performance requires a specialist on this. So let's look back in here at this. Performance engineering needs dedicated expertise, and it's a unique skill set. It is a valuable investment. We believe that it brings a a lot of ROI uh, to a company. And the continuous measurement and improvement and testing and tuning and monitor with these specialists will give you the most bang for the buck. Here's another one. Data is the foundation for informed decision. We believe in continuously monitoring and getting measurements across the SDLC, having a data-driven approach. In other words, what gets monitored gets done. What gets measured gets done. Sharing this knowledge is the fuel for innovation. You don't want to just take that information and hoard it Uh, or not share how you do something, you want to share that information. And last but not least is that performance is part of 
the business imperative. It's not just a technical problem to solve. It is something that's going to drive your business. It has to do with real money. This is the part of the story that I think our community, the performance community, has really lacked in, is being able to talk at the the level that the C-level cares about, which is mostly how the company is being impacted from a risk perspective or from a financial perspective. If the performance engineers can talk the lingo or say the words that, that map to this is costing you money. This is going to cost you in terms of risk. There is a very real risk that you are going to have an event here that's going to cause an outage that will that will cause detrimental harm to the company. When you begin to talk in those terms, those risk officers and those, those chief decision makers, they want to know that. And when you can back up and prove it from your metrics, from your information, they will listen to you. You'll become a valuable asset to the company. And when you begin to talk in terms and tell the story of how, yes, you did all this technical stuff, you created all this scripts, you wrote code, you got in the pipeline and you monitored all this stuff and you got graphs and charts out the yin yang, right? It it doesn't matter when you're at that, the important meeting where there's a business decision being made, you want to talk in terms of the business to these people. And that's, that's where it counts. And that's when you tell the story that way, this is where our group, our community gets the visibility uh, to be risen around us. And we, we are able to show the true rock stars that we are to a company. So that's, that was the foundation of Dev Perf Ops. So that's part of the DevOps manifesto. Now, there's other information out there on the site. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I'll encourage you to go to devperfops.org and take a look at it. Now, where do we want to go from here? Uh, I'm one person. I can't do do everything, and it's going to take a team of people. Now there are people on that I have a, a network with, um, Jacob Daring, um, and there's some other people who have volunteered to be part of this. Uh, we have some blogs that have been written. Uh, we have people who actively want to pursue turning this into something. And I've had people call me and say, "I will help uh, pay for the uh, the paperwork, the legal paperwork to to build this foundation. I will help you uh, do that." Which is it's all great. But we have to have enough people involved in the beginning to actually t- to make a difference with this. Otherwise, it's going to be something that just we put out there, we make a big uh, stink about it for a little while, and then it's going to be forgotten. So I would love to see uh, a, some type of a conference or a meetup, even if it's very small uh, and doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And maybe it's virtual for the first couple of years, but where we get together and actually discuss how do we take our performance community forward and can we use this as a framework to bring everybody together because we know that software that's being developed today, uh, unless you're part of a 150 year old company who still has to maintain some waterfall stuff for good reasons, most software is moving towards shift left DevOps continuous, uh, running things in containerized environments, Kubernetes becoming the operating system of the cloud, et cetera, et cetera, microservices, not monoliths. And some of that, that's going to, the pendulum is going to swing back and forth. And again, we have to adapt to that. But can we bring DevProfOps as a foundation, as as a framework that we can unify everybody together? Even if you're from that waterfall world, you can still do DevProfOps because you're doing the perf in DevProfOps. And and a performance engineer should be able to operate within, they should be able to go back to a waterfall method and still operate efficiently and successfully. I mean, I did it for years. And if software is being developed that way, if you put the proper procedures in there, processes around around it, you will succeed. Uh, I don't think I ever had an application go down in production that was thoroughly tested through the right processes that we put it through. There may have been things that failed that we never tested because we just couldn't get to it in terms of scope, but it wasn't something that went through, through my performance testing lab. I'll put it to you that way. And the same is true for uh, continuous delivery in a CI/CI p- pipeline. The main thing I think developers are concerned about is performance engineers kind of getting in the way and causing friction with their development process. We don't want to do that, right? We want to give the we don't want to say, okay, developers, you develop code and then you hand it all over to us and let us do our thing. Then we'll hand it back to you. We we you can't operate like that, right? You have to do things number one in parallel when you can, but you need to give the developers 
and empower them to do as much as they can with the tools they're used to doing it with to get the kind of feedback they need to keep that um, friction as low as possible. But there's going to come a time where there is a a build or there is a release where certain uh, tests need to be run that's larger and outside of the scope of just what the developer's um, functionality and, and initial testing would do, the shift left testing. There needs to be something that, that looks at the systems as a whole and how they affect other systems as well. And that's where we, we come in and that's where the specialists come in. So at a, at a high level, I've just described what DevProfOps is. And I think that if you check out the website, it will, and you read through it, it will make sense. And this is where you come in. I would really like to hear your feedback about this. Do you think, now, now, before I do that, before I get your feedback, let's just step back for a moment. Should DevProfOps be a thing? No. For the same reason that DevSecOps should not be a thing. But it has to exist. DevSecOps has to exist because DevOps did not produce the results that businesses required. And I think for the same reason, dev perfops have, has to exist for that same reason. Now, does that mean that you could take this to another level? Well, dev test ops, dev biz ops, biz, all, you know, yes, you could, you could get crazy with it. All right. But I can only tell you about my purview, right? If you have a DevOps organization and you are making performance a non-negotiable and it is working for you, you don't need dev perfops. Same would be true for security. But if you're not, then this subcategory may be the framework you need to build in that culture and make it work for you. I'm thinking that performance really should be more of a, a just a, a group within DevOps, and, and it should be different, uh, different roles within the organization can be part of this. And this small, like little community can be part of making sure performance is good. But until that happens, maybe dev perfops is the initiating trigger that makes it happen. So I don't think it should exist, but for the same reason that DevSecOps exists, I think it must exist. Now, you may disagree, and that's fine. I'd love to hear your comments in uh, on the video or on any of the postings on social media. Would love to see it. And let me tell you how you can get in touch with me. So I'm really easy to find. I'm, I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn, but I'm also on other uh, social media platforms as well. And you can scan that QR code to find out more about that. But you can send me direct feedback if you just want to contact me through heyscott at smcjournal.com. Uh, it would also be great, by the way, if you subscribed to my channel to help that YouTube algorithm know that I'm out there and that I'm creating content that you want to see. When you can get rid of DevSecOps, I think we should give up DevProfOps, FinOps, and all the other things. When DevOps gets implemented correctly across the board, which I don't think is ever going to happen because I know how people are and I know how companies are, when all of these companies that we looked at at the beginning of the show, IBM, AWS, Microsoft, when they begin to start taking down those sites of what is DevSecOps, when the people who write the, the training labs for DevSecOps turn those off and they don't, they're not making any more money off of teaching you DevSecOps, then we could turn DevProfOps off. But my argument is if they get theirs, if security people get theirs, performance engineers get theirs. Like it, lump it. So what do you think? We will see you on the next SMC Journal show. Until then, Scott Moore saying thanks for watching again. Bye-bye.